Hi there. Hi. Okay. So I am going to see if I can make you a co host. Okay. Yeah. Last right. time I looked, we had like 26 people interested in our. 28 just now. 28 now. Wow. Good. Yeah. All right. I should be able to make you. Yeah. Make you the co host. Okay. Okay, am I the co-host now so I can let people in? Yeah. And stuff? Okay, and you get your stuff organized. We have four people. We have, okay, so we want to let people in now? We should go ahead and let them uh, in. Let's, let's wait I'm a second. I'm going to, let me put a chat. Oh, I'm going to make sure that we can screen share that anybody okay. can. I'm going to say we'll be opening the room. So I changed the screen share setting, so you should be able to screen share. In two minutes. Yeah, garbage. Yeah, there's three waiting right now, so I just let them know that we'll be opening the room in two minutes. So they're you no, know, so they're not like go someplace else. Okay, do you want to make sure I can share my screen? Let me see if I can. Yep, I did. You should okay. be able to. Let me just make sure. Yep, I can. Okay. Let me close it. Okay. I'm good. And you're recording already. I guess it's recording right away. Oh, bother. People coming. Here we go. I'm going to start admitting people. Sounds good. Hello. 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 Hi everyone. Thanks for coming on an early Saturday morning. If there are things that you really would like us to cover um, or things you'd really like to know before you leave our workshop today, if you want to stick them in the chat box, uh, we can let you know if we'll be covering that or if you might want to chat with us afterwards. So feel free to put it in the chat. Also, it'd be, also it'd be great too if you could put uh, where you're from. And maybe what your, you know, uh, profession or? Yep. Oops. I, think. I see Aaron here. I know a couple of you guys, Aaron. And yeah, I'm just trying to get my computer going. Oh my! This is my last <laughs> my my last day with this old relic, and it barely let me into this meeting. <laughs> Getting a new computer? Yes, tomorrow finally. And yay! Yay! Who knows though? My I won't probably set it up tomorrow, but I couldn't even get the chat box to open, and oh boy! <laughs> yeah. I see Stephanie's here. See, I know some of you guys. Oh, there's lots of people coming in now. Yeah. 
Yeah. So you want a mini bio in the chat for yeah, everyone. Or just, just a hi. Sort of yeah, yeah, just a hi. Just, and where, yeah, are from. just where you're from. Kind of gives yeah. us an idea. If you have any burning questions. I have burning questions. I'm teaching graduate studies in autism. So come on, what's going on? No joking. Oh. Well, <laughs> yeah. you, you got to connect with uh, Monica afterwards then. Oh yeah, Monica and I go back. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah there. We do there go back. Go. You know, it's, yeah. But we, we decided we're going to write something together, right, Monica? Yeah, we are. We're going to do that. We should put in an abstract. I'll, I'll send you a call out today because there's a, my work is asking for abstracts by Monday. So maybe we have something we want to write. Or maybe you and Kathy have something you guys want to write about this. You never know. I'll send it to you. Yeah, definitely. Monday. <laughs> Not, yeah. Oh, no, you only have to send the abstract. And then, oh, okay. and then, oh. and it only has to be like two to three pages, single spaced about what you're working on. Okay. Right. It's a good one. It goes to all the Canada teachers, right? So you guys oh, can get you up go. here. Oh, all right. I'm awesome. muting myself working on my bio here. No. Okay. Hi, Lisa. Okay. I'm from Michigan too. Great. So we've got someone from Saskatchewan and we've got someone from California. I'm Andrew from South Africa. I don't know if you can see me. I can't see myself oh. on the screen. Hi, Andrew. Hi. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Nikki, Malaysia. Oh my gosh, you're up late. Thank you for coming. <gasps> my brain starts turning off at that time of night. <laughs> Letting people in here. We're going to get going in just a few minutes here. We're just asking if everybody can put in the chat box where you're from and if you have any burning questions or um, what's bringing you here today. Hi. We got lots, I think. Got one new message here at the bottom. Oh, hi, Lynn from Malaysia. And Kathy. Oh, gosh, it's been a while. Yeah, I said, I haven't seen Kathy for a long time. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Great to see you. <laughs> it's yeah, fun to see old faces and, and meet new people, too. Hi, Stephanie. Good morning. I'm looking forward to this talk. Very important oh, to me. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. It's so, like I said, it's, it's one of the things I love about Arrow, and I think I write that every summer, a blog that says it's fun to see old people, you know, old friends, and, and then you get to meet new people. And one of the benefits of the pandemic, actually, and this is like, you know, a very small silver lining is that those of us who've been around Arrow for a while have been getting together on Sunday afternoons. And I prefer, yeah, I feel like I should provide bagels and cream cheese. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and of course, a good pot of coffee. Oh well, yeah, I've got my I've got my coffee here. Kathy was smarter; she brought a thermos, but mine will be cold. But it'll be all right. Hey, we probably should get going here. I'll keep letting people in, Kathy, if you want to get started. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks, Monica. So we're just asking that as you enter in, if you can put your name in the or. Uh, where you're from in the chat box and just a little bio. Right now, I can't see the chat when you're when I'm screen sharing. It's really hard for uh, to monitor the chat. So I'll look at those afterwards. Also, as we go along, I ask that you mute your mics so that we can, uh, you know, not have any other background noise and that um, if you have questions, set them in the chat. And at the end, toward the end, we're going to take a look at those. And in, depending on the amount of time that we have, we'll, we'll uh, see if we can address them. So we just have a short hour together in our presentation, what has happened to this child using neuroscience to develop a more compassionate understanding of behavior. I'm Kathy Magnuson. And just a little bit about myself is that I have a business called Wildwood Learning. I'm located here in northwestern Minnesota. So I am in a rural area, 10 miles from Canada, 20 miles from um, that little, you know, Lake of the Woods or which is 
kind of the tip of Minnesota. So I'm a very rural area and my business is Wildwood Learning where I work with educators, schools, and youth professionals. And I do trainings that are in resiliency informed skills. So that is kind of an umbrella that covers social emotional learning. ACEs, which are adverse childhood experiences, and we'll be talking about those today, and strength-based learning. And I'm gonna turn it over to Monica for just let her introduce herself. All right. Um, I'm Monica Cochran, and I'm right outside of Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I work with uh, families and kids and uh, all around the world. I have a, a program called Learning Without Borders. That's my um, business, and um, I've been in alternative education for over 40 years, worked um, with kids in schools, parents, um, business. I've been a corporate trainer as well. So um, most recently in the last 25 years, I've been working with a lot of um, distance learning and home learning kids, um, kind of specialize in those quirky ones, you know, the ones that um, have a little bit of, you know, hot spikes here and difficulties here. I've worked with two organizations um, and ran their global learning program. So I've done a lot of different things, but now I'm really, really enjoying um, working with kids all over the world and families too, to help them really enjoy learning, you know, in ways they have it. And part of it gets in the way sometime is what we're going to be talking about um, today. So I will turn it over so Kathy can get going. Yeah. Thanks, Monica. And my background is also in public ed education. I have been a science teacher, a high school teacher, and then moved into the world of social emotional learning, working in schools, teaching social emotional learning skills as a specialist. And I've been doing that since 2004. I've also done a girls leadership program, but I'm a director of Girls Lead and have used a lot of the skills that we are talking about today and the information and pulling it all together. And Monica and I met through uh, the organization Self-Design when they were doing parent circles. And so I have always had a alternative twist to my te teachings and love and alternative education. So in our hour together, these are our outcomes that we are going to address. We want you to walk away with a basic understanding of the neuroscience of trauma and its effects on humans, some strategies for creating safety relationships that you have, practices for adults to stay grounded with children in other challenging situations, and strategies to reliance in ourselves and children. And as you're entering this room, we just ask that you use the chat and put any of your questions in the chat and we'll address them towards the end. And also if you can mute your mics, please. So what's happened to this child is the title of our, our presentation. And you can see that there's children here or young adults in this picture that are showing some behaviors of of stress. I'm going to tell you a little story about my son Joseph. Joseph, when he was in sixth grade, he, his uh, personality is that he's very much a rule follower. Things are really black and white to him. He sometimes has a really, actually a lot, most of the time has a really hard time communicating what his needs are and also communicating how he feels. He's really great with talking about just facts and things of that sort. So they were in Fayette one day and playing dodgeball, which I think should be outlawed as a game to play in Fayette. However, as they were playing dodgeball, he was noticing that kids weren't following the rules. Or, and he was thinking that one of these boys had not followed the rules. He was calling them out on it. Uh, the behavior, or not behaviors, but they started to escalate. And before you know it, Joseph punched the kid. He hit the kid. This, of course, caused an out-of-school suspension. And a lot of the people or administrators, the teachers, were asking, what's wrong with this kid? What would make him to not say anything and just punch out? 
at another child. Well, we're going to talk about that because what we're hoping in this hour together is that we're shifting from what's wrong with you to what's happened to you and then ultimately what's right with you. We're going to start out talking about adverse childhood experiences. Now, some of you may be really familiar with this and others may not. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but just to go through and make sure that everybody is kind of on the same page about what adverse childhood experiences are. So adverse childhood experiences was a study done in the early 1990s. It's one of the largest studies done of its kind. It was 17,000 people that were surveyed by two researchers. It was combined. The research was uh, from a researcher from Kaiser Permanente and a researcher from the CDC. Their names were Dr. Anda and Dr. Folletti. In the adverse childhood experience, they were, they were asking adults about their childhood experiences and what had happened in their household. And the study, had, the participants in the study were mainly white, middle-class, college-educated uh, people. And what they found as they were asking all of these questions that many of the adverse childhood experiences fell into these three categories, abuse that happened, neglect, and dis house, uh, uh, household dysfunction. And these 10 categories were then used as kind of a, uh, a way to also correlate along with the person's health as an adult. So they asked when these things happen in childhood, 18 years, 18 years and under. They didn't ask what time period in childhood, but just if they happened in childhood. And what they found out if these 10 factors is that the higher the score in the adults, the higher the risk factors. So they were noticing that people that had four or more ACEs of those 10 factors, there was an increase in amount that smoked. They noticed that people who had four or more ACEs, there was an increase in alcoholism, increase in depression. So all of these risk factors increased these health factors in later in life. Well, they were then draw the conclusion that ACEs lead to an impaired neural development, which led to adaptations, which then led to these increased risk factors that affected health and well-being in the adult lives. As studies went on, there were other things that they looked at, other adverse childhood experiences like consistent peer victimization or being rejected and isolated, poverty and uh, exposure to violence in a community and historical trauma. And this diagram I really like because it shows all of these different things in different categories that could cause adverse childhood experiences, things that are happening in the household, in the community, and in the environment. So the household, for example, you know, divorce, physical neglect, bullying, domestic abuse are all things that are household uh, childhood experiences that are adverse. What's happening now? Distance learning. Here for the past uh, few months, we've had distance learning. I have four children. Three of them were doing distance learning. One from college, two from high school. One was a senior. He graduated. And it caused stress in our household. I will tell you, there was an increased amount of stress and it caused a lot of increased amount of stress in a lot of different households. In our community, which are things like historical trauma, substandard schools, laxo jobs, right now there's protests going on and riots that were happening. This is caused by systemic racism that's pervasive. 
it's causing stress in our communities. And then environmental. Those could be things like climate crisis or natural disasters that happen, storms and earthquakes, but it also can include things like COVID-19 and our pandemic that's occurring here. That's why we're virtual. And that's why we're not in Minneapolis. It's causing stress that's in our environment. So let's look a little bit at brain, our brain and, and stress. So the neuroscience really helps us understand why ACEs are so powerful. It's because it affects our neurobiology, our sensory system. So we know that the brain is made up of neurons. These are those brain cells that are making connections within our, in our brain. And a lot of this wiring happens during our childhood. And we have, we have two parts of the brain here that we're going to be addressing. One is the amygdala. And our amygdala is that fight, flight, faint, freeze area that when we are sensing danger and when we are sensing something that uh, needs immediate attention, we go into our amygdala. Now our prefrontal cortex, that's the thinking part of our brain. And that's where all of our executive functioning happens and our thinking happens and, and decision making, responsible decision making happens. So these two parts of their brain are really important when we're talking about how we deal with fear and with stress. And there's three different levels of stress response. So the adverse childhood experiences are happening. They're causing stress in a, in a child's life. And lots of times we need stress in our life. You know, that's the thing that helps us to move forward, to get things done. And when it's brief our, and our heart rate increases a little bit and there's a little mild elevation in our stress hormones, which are called cortisol is one of the main stress hormones, that's positive. That's fine. You know, a baby cries and there's a little increase in their heart rate and their stress hormones elevate and then it's fed or it's picked up. However, there's also things like tolerable stress. And this is when we have a serious but temporary stress response. When this happens in childhood, like talking about the baby, they cry, their stress hormones go up. An adult that's caring, supportive comes and says, oh, what's wrong? You know, let's take care of that. Let's change your diaper. The stress level then goes down, the cortisol goes down. So there's a caring adult that's mitigating that stress level for that child. However, when there's toxic stress occurring, these are prolonged activated stress responses and there's an absence of protective relationships like a caring adult in their life or one that's inconsistent. So maybe the baby cries and sometimes the baby gets picked up or the baby cries and no one comes. And after a while, that cortisone is released at higher levels for longer durations. And when that happens in childhood, that's affecting the brain architecture and affecting the, how the neurons are connecting and creating. Actually can do some, this is really interesting, the brain science of it, is that it can actually, if it's happening, these prolonged, toxic stress experiences at certain times, they can see that certain parts of the brain are not as developed. And then when it comes to later in life, when those parts need to be more developed, it, they're, they're not there or they're, they're damaged. The neural system is damaged in some way. So ACEs, it's really important for you to know that these are predictable and they're preventable and that they have the effect on the neurobiology. So when, as I go back to my son, Joseph, when we adopted him when he was age seven and we adopted him out of foster care along with his three younger siblings, when coming to our home, he had had a lot of toxic stress experiences, a lot of adverse childhood experiences in, even before the age of, of seven. And we all know how important those ages are, especially zero through five, when brains are really developing. 
those things have um, have affected the way that he behaves. And as I gave in the earlier example about his behavior in phi ed class and people asking about what's wrong with this kid, it's really more about what's happened to this child. So Monica and I are going to switch here. We're going to take a moment and I'm going to exit out of screen share and she's going to share her screen and she's going to talk a little bit about the more about the neurobiology and what's happening in the brain. So Monica, you're muted. Of course I'm muted. I'm not hearing you. That's fine. I want to be muted, but not, not right now. I didn't, but I did before. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to share my screen here and hopefully you'll see how messy my desktop is for a minute, but then it will be okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? I hope so. Yes, we can All see right. it. Great. And I'm going to go see if I can move into my presentation mode here and move everything out of my way. Because I think, there we go. All right, so, all right, okay. So as Kathy was saying, just to kind of summarize, there are patterns of stress. And when the pattern is predictable and it's moderate and it's controllable, we actually develop resilience. But when it's unpredictable, it's extreme, it's prolonged, it just increases, it sensitizes us and it increases our vulnerability. So let's see if I, all oh, right. So we kind of look at behavior as communication. And when we see that unexpected behavior that we often do, or we're not expecting it, you know, there's a tendency for us to quickly, I want to get rid of that behavior, right? <laughs> that behavior is, is in the way, it's interfering. It could be interfering with the relationship. It could be interfering with learning. Um, however, we really need to become stress detectors. You know, we kind of need to become a detective and we've got to look below that. Because if we don't look below, we're not going to reframe it. So as Kathy was saying, if, when it was her son, Joseph, you know, if somebody had looked at that and said, let's reframe this as a stress behavior. This is a kid who's having a stress. And this was his attempt in that class to minimize the stresses. I mean, he was trying to control the environment so he could feel safe again. And so for us, if we can reframe our thinking then we can look to identify the stressors and help reduce them and respond in ways that help them learn some skills that are gonna be more useful than what he was trying to do. So let me go on to my next slide here so I can show you a little bit. But there's something that's happening in everybody's brain and that's what we call our negativity bias. We are hardwired to look for problems. We are hardwired because we wouldn't be here if we haven't. When somebody's had a number of of adverse experiences, they're really hardwired, but we all are. And we're all have a variety of stresses every day. So we need at least three positives for every negative thing that we share just to stay even. But if we'd like a relationship with someone to thrive, we need five to one. We need five positive responses for every negative one. So that's huge for us. Now, one thing that I learned a while back, maybe about 15 years ago now, maybe not quite that long, is the concept of neuroception. And this is a term that was coined by Stephen Porges. And he, he coined this term to help us understand that most of our neuroception is happening subconsciously. So when we say this kid's making a bad choice and they're having a stress response, they're not thinking. It's kind of like our little TSA agent and usually it's working pretty well with our sensory systems, as Kathy was saying, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, that it works with our sensory systems to keep us safe. But however, it can be faulty sometimes. And, and Dr. Poor just came up with what he calls the polyvagal theory. So where we're stressed or something triggers a previous stress, then this lovely nerve called the vagus nerve that goes all the way through our body, it's one of our 12 cranial nerves. It works from the base of our brain all the way down through our body. It touches every organ. And we really recognize it when we hear things, when we feel things like, oh, I'm, I'm getting that feeling in my stomach. You guys probably remember that, right? Your hands and your feet get a little cold. Um, your breath becomes more rapid. Your heart rate increases, as Kathy mentioned. Um, even our vision can change when we're afraid. It narrows. Our hearing changes 
we don't hear the normal tone of voice. We only hear the really high ones and we're really, really sensitive to the predatory sounds. Like my dog's hearing somebody going down the street. This is activating them. Hopefully someone's going to close my door. I apologize. Hang on. Nobody's helping me out. Hang on one second. Guys, you could have helped me out here. And I can just feel myself doing that too. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Um, yeah, I apologize. Well, I just felt myself go into fight or flight there just for a minute. And I could feel my heart rate go up just now. And I also felt my hands get clammy. So the vagus nerve actually works up our body. And 80 to 90% of it goes from your body to your brain. So what we need to do when that happens, what's happening is our limbic system, as Kathy was mentioning, the amygdala, that part of our brain that's in this part of our hand, if we were using this as a model, it lights up. And I can feel myself right now feeling that way. <laughs> so it's hard to plan. It's hard to think. And our prefrontal cortex and our cortex, that green part, when that happens and we get upset, then it just goes dark. So for that moment, just now, as I was going over there, it was like all I could think about was get the door closed and get the dogs quiet so you could get back. There was no planning, no thinking about what I was going to say next. Luckily, my slides are in order and everything's working out okay. Let me go to my next slide here. All right, so most of the time we're in what we, these are the three states that Dr. Poor just talked about. And this is a very sim simple explanation. If you're interested in learning more about his work, it's very deep. But we have a number of states that we operate in. And the green is our social engagement state. Now that's when our parasympathetic system is working from what he calls our ventral vagal because our vagus nerve is one of our oldest nerves and it has two branches. And the old branch is what we call our unmyelinated one and it impacts everything below our diaphragm. And that's why we feel that in our stomach. We feel our legs getting jittery. So when we're in social engagement, we can learn. We can experience the joy, we have curiosity, we have openness, we can learn. When we get activated, even that just that minute just now when my dogs were barking and it was interfering, my body went into fight and flight. And you can see that little curvy line there. And we want to keep it there. Like right now I'm taking some deeper breaths and I'm trying to breathe out so that I can get regulated again and still do this presentation with you guys. So that little wavy line is kind of like flattening the curve. So as I take that breath and I breathe out, my body can relax again. And but when we can't, it, we go into fight and flight. And that's when you see that kid getting activated or you feel yourself getting activated. And then for some time, we actually go into freeze. And that's where you see the animal, you know, that just freezes. We do too. There are people in, in situations that just can't react. So that's the freeze model. And I like this one a little bit better because it, it's a little it gets, gets to the point pretty quickly, right? You feel the smoke coming out of your, your ears, uh, and then you see the kid that seems just totally have checked, totally checked out. So the goal of all of this is, is to experience the stress, recover, pause, and so that you're essentially letting out the air out of the balloon a little bit at a time. Otherwise, it'll keep getting bigger and bigger, and then you're going to have a an explosion, which happens. And then hopefully there's an adult around or not the person that can have your back and help you out. Kathy, I'm gonna turn this over to you for a second because you're gonna do our grounding exercise. So this is something I probably really need right now. So I will be an active participant. <laughs> I'm gonna put myself on mute here. <laughs> yep, thanks, Monica. Um, I see in the chat people asking if our slides will be available, and they are. At the end, we're going to have a link where you can uh, sign up to get a resource guide, and we'll make our slides as part of that resource guide, along with lots of other things that we think are important to this topic. So I'm going to ask everybody if you can uh, sit up or make sure your feet are on the ground, you're nice and straight. Taking a deep breath and we're going to do a little exercise, grounding exercise together. And this can be done uh, in your head or you can do it along with your children. 
And the first thing we ask you to do is look around in your environment and pick out five things that you can see. Now, when you're doing this with children, they can name the five things to you, or you can take turns going back and forth, but just five things that you can see. And right now I'm looking out my window and I can see lots of different things. Then take another breath. And I want you to look around your environment. And what are four things that you could touch? Take time. Four different things that you could touch. Now breathe in, take another deep breath, breathe it out slowly. If you didn't have earplugs in like me or headset on, what would be three things that you could hear? Or what are three things that you could hear? Take another deep breath. Slowly blow it out. And as you take this next deep breath, what are two things that you smell? Two things that you smell. And take another breath and slowly blow it out. And what would be one thing that you would love to taste? So after those five things, as you go through them and using all of your senses, you can feel your body just kind of slowing down, taking the time to move from your amygdala into your prefrontal cortex and just grounding yourself a bit in what's around you and not in your thoughts or what's been causing your heart rate to elevate. So this is a great one to do with kids, do along with them and people, and you can call out things and it brings the attention back to the present. So Monica. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. I really needed that. So. <laughs> So this is one of what we would call bottom-up strategies, because when we're in the moment, as we mentioned, usually our prefrontal cortex is not on board. So breathing in and a long exhale is really important. The other one we talk a lot about is just really putting your hand over your heart. There's something about feeling your own heartbeat. It goes back to when we were in the womb. Rhythmic music is huge. Um, this movement in general helps us regulate. And when it's rhythmic, it really helps us regulate. Likewise, singing, sighing. Kids love doing a dragon breath where you breathe out. And some, one of our resources, there'll be a lot of um, activities you can actually do with kids. We call them kind of mindfulness things, but you need to practice these things ahead of time. So when you're in the moment, when you say dragon breath, it means something to the kid. Humming is huge. Chanting is another one. Um, that's why listening to Gregorian chant really helps some kids. Chewing gum is a great one, as long as they're not going to swallow it all the time. But chewing gum is great. Um, loving touch. And for some kids, loving has a different meaning. So for some kids, it needs to be firmer on the back, right? For some kids do not like that light touch. Sometimes somebody just putting their hands really heavily on your, whole, on your shoulders can really help a lot. And smiling. Smiling is huge. It's universal. And we want a real smile. You know, the smile that makes your eyes crinkle. And when you're older, you get to see everybody's wrinkles. But those are all really helpful ones. Let me see if I can hear. So what we want to do right now is to have you guys break out into some breakout rooms and really talk about the ways that you regulate from bottom up. Because this is just a sampling of different kinds of ways to do it. So we'd like to put you into some breakout rooms and have you guys chat about what are the ways that you find personally that help you pause and recover. Kathy, you want to break everybody out into breakout rooms there? 
Yeah, so there's going to be uh, two to three people in a breakout room and you can discuss this question and also what you've been listening to. We are going to give you, I'm just looking at the time here, how, many, how much time should we? About, about five minutes maybe? Not a long Five time, minutes, but. yep, and then we'll bring you all back into the room. So when it pops up, if you haven't used breakout rooms, when it pops up, just click on it and it'll take you to the breakout room. And then when time's almost up, it will give you a countdown and just come back in. Sometimes it kind of takes a little moment before it comes, uh, before you come back into the main room. All right, and we're, ready and we're to gonna, go. There you go. And we're gonna ask you to put it in the chat room. Put it in the chat box. Oh yes, put some of your yes. So answer the question. You can answer the question. Put when you come back into the room and put your um, answers in the chat box. Thanks. Yeah, we'll put them all together. Oh, looks like Stephanie's still here. Are you with us? And Lynn and Shalaha? Yeah, so just... Looks like see. there's still a couple people left here, Kath. Okay. I'll um, set my timer here. See if I can get you into a breakout. Mm -hmm. um, Gregory? If you can join the breakout room too, please. Um, or I can move you to another one. There, I'll move you to eight. Okay, there. And then Nikki. Oh, no, we still have Nikki. Yeah. Oh. Ah. What else is left here? There we go. There are people, they might not be there. Okay. They maybe stepped away. Might have stepped away. Because they're assigned to breakout rooms. They just haven't. I got to go put Riley out here. He's yeah, I can hear him. Way. Yeah. Hey, can you hear him? Yeah. yeah okay, yeah. I'll be right back. <laughs> you got four minutes. You have four minutes to come back. Well, that was quick, Kath. So, so Monica? Yep. Um, hey, uh, I can't see. How many more slides do we have? Would this be a better place to switch? Um, yeah. What it, what's yeah. after? It's a, it's a good time. Um, I just have one slide that when we're back in social connection, but why don't we... Um, okay. Let me do that one and then we can do it. Okay, I'm going to go to the next one. But I want to just hear from, you know, we'll see what's in the chat box. Maybe you might highlight a couple of them since you can see it better than I can. If there's, when we come back and they put. Or we there. could just, you know, we could get out of the slide presentation right now. So when they come back in, we can see each other. Okay, let's do that. I'll get and then I'll share. Okay. How does that sound after we share what's been in the yep. chat box? Sounds good. I'll stop my share right now. I don't know if I put a time. I did, I have my timer on, it's two minutes. Left. Oh, good, okay. I think I could have set the rooms to close at a certain time, but I can't. Okay, you're gonna need to do Tell it. Tell me when there's one minute left and then I'll. Okay. You were inviting me to break out room one, but I couldn't see it. So, Let's see, we got another message here. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, you know, too, I'm sorry. Erin just if put a message in. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. that's okay. Never mind. It happens. Yeah, I guess. Oh. Do we not get everybody to the breakout rooms? I think it gets hard if, if there are people in breakout rooms and they're not all participating. It gets hard for, for folks to, who, are, who do want to participate. So, 
Well, half the time it's technology well, problems, right? Like yeah, my pop right. up wasn't coming right. up to even go to a breakout room, and I had to go and and hit the things, and it it, yeah. it works and it doesn't work. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So I just like to, we'll just do a little apology to everybody in case they didn't get to where they needed to go. And technology is great. Well, and the works. other thing too. Yeah. Oh, okay. The go other ahead. thing too is that um, if you're doing this through the whoa. Uvo app or whatever, you know, you can watch the presentations through the app. Yeah, that, I think that's so the problem. I, yeah, so I don't know if, if you're watching through the presentation through the app, if you can use the breakout room feature or not, I'm not sure. Um, I don't, I think I did, because on Thursday I was, and I think I was Oh, there's Nikki, she said able. that, she, well, see, that was my problem. I knew when you guys were hitting the buttons so that I needed to find the pop up because I'm having trouble with this computer. <laughs> oh. And it was like, okay, I knew there was like an allow button that I need to press where I wasn't going to see my opportunity. Yeah. So, sorry, can you, Nikki. Can you, well, we can have our own little breakout room right here. Yeah, we have like 30 se eight seconds left. What are some strategies you guys use to, to kind of bottom up? Are there some that you guys use? You kind of saw mine real quick. <sighs> As I was coming back to the screen. <laughs> I think people are going to be coming back in a few minutes, seconds here. I always thought art was a good thing. Like a, a lot of learners really respond to it. Mm hmm Yep. For some people, doodling. It doesn't even have to be art. It can just be doodling. I find myself that when I'm calm, I'm making little circles and things. And when I'm not, I'm doing squares. <laughs> so <laughs> I think you're, everybody's coming back, Kathy. Yeah, Hello, they'll be back here in just a yeah. few seconds. And so we'll just wait. Um, as we're waiting here for everybody to come back into the main room, you can go ahead and write in the chat box, what are some of the bottom-up strategies that you discussed in your, uh, in your breakout room? And we have to apologize for some of, some people didn't get into a breakout room. And uh, so we apologize for that. You know, technology is great when it works. Yeah, very much. So feel free to put it into the chat so, if there were other ones that you use that we didn't talk about. Oh yeah, drinking a glass of water is good. I'm gonna mute myself, Kathy, because I see my dogs are gonna start barking here. Yeah, lying down, breathing, using music. Praying, walking, yoga, breathing, touching a tree. That's cool. Using, and using over exaggerated gestures, mindfulness. Uh, I, I, and uh, sometimes too, for myself and for my my family it's we're hungry i used to you know have a lot of outbursts and things like that right before supper time i don't know if you can relate but you know hunger can be a great bottom down strategy just having something to eat laughing yeah we always talk about the arsenic hour you know that time yep yep so we have a few more minutes here together, in fact, about 15 more minutes. And so we're going to finish up our presentation. I'm going to share my screen. Keep putting in those ideas of what your bottom down or yeah, bottom down strategies are. So Monica. Okay. Everybody see the screen? Monica? 
Yes, thank you, Kathy. I just heard my dogs and I didn't want to turn on until they would stop barking. Uh, so once we're in a calmer state, and then we can then begin to use regulate and we can begin to think about how to handle this. Um, until we're calm, it's almost next to impossible to help another person like a child or another person be calm. My husband and I always kind of laugh. We both can't be flipping our lids at the same time, right? Somebody has to be the calm person to keep things going. So once, Kathy, do you want to move it to the next slide there? Once we're regulated again and we're even, then our prefrontal cortex comes back online. And then we can then begin to help the other person actually use their strengths, use our own strengths. And Kathy's going to um, give a good example here because once we're regulated, then we can, we can make the shift from what's wrong to what's strong. Go ahead, Kathy. All right. So as Monica was saying, uh, this all begins with you. It begins with you regulating yourself. And as I come back to my son, Joseph, that I was talking about in the example, I found that I had to use those bottom up strategies first before I could even help him to regulate. And also I needed to use those bottom up strategies. Then I could tap into my strengths and figure and use those strengths to help him calm down and regulate and have those bottom up strategies so that he can see his strengths. So I began talking about how when he was in sixth grade, he was triggered, how we adopted him when he, in his uh, three younger siblings when he was seven, and now he's 21. And as a 21 year old, he has a job, he goes, he, that he works at, he works at the post office, he has interests, he has his chickens that he takes care of every day, and he also has friends, both he's really involved in the bowling team before COVID-19 hit and they had to stop bowling and then also gaming, he's made lots of friends on gaming. So by having him be able to regulate, calm himself down, and then we could really tap into what was right about him, about his strengths, about how he related with other people, how he, what he loved and what his interests were and what he really valued when it came to um, finding friends, finding a job and finding hobbies. So these are some of the top down strengths and you really can't start using these top down strengths until you have addressed and, and your prefrontal cortex comes back online. And to help kids really think about what are some of their top down strengths and to help yourself think about that, you know, get really curious both with yourself and with the children that you work with. Uh, connecting with families and friends can be a great top down strategy. Predictable routines. I really recognize that with my kids that when we get predictable routines in place and for myself, you know, having a predictable routine once I had the kids at home and having uh, to do my work at home, putting that routine into place really helped. That also then promotes safety and you feel safe when you know what you can predict and what's coming up and what can we expect and how people are going to, to react to things. Um, partner with others, looking at their strengths and then looking at your own strengths and really tapping into the other person's strengths so that um, when, when, you're, when you're working together. Tend to befriend and be really intentional. This all takes good intentional work and being intentional about, about how you want to use your strengths and who you want to connect with and how you want those to show up in the world is what we're talking about. So our attitudes we were talking about at the beginning is shifting from the traditional what's wrong with you and looking at the trauma informed and how trauma can, can really affect you and shifting that question to what's happened to you 
and ultimately shifting into being more resiliency informed and looking at what's right with you and what are your strengths. So I'm going to, uh, Monica, you yep. want to come back online here? I am. Yep. Okay. Do you want to, what are some of the questions? And, and we'll ask people if they want to unmute themselves. Feel or, free to ask questions. We have a, just a minute or two here that we can dive into some of them. Yep. And maybe we can stop screen sharing now. Oh, no, you want to show the last slide so that people yeah, can Yeah, we'll do the up. last one here and just. Okay. So feel free to put in any questions into the chat box or just unmute yourself. I think you can do that. I don't think we have everybody muted. But um, I think just looking at um, your own strengths. And if you want to, um, if you want a couple tools for that, we, Kathy and I have some tools. We'll put them in the resource guide for identifying strengths. Um, and that might be helpful. I know Jackie just put in partnering with others and recognizing our own limitations. Yeah, I think once we are aware of what our strengths are, it's a lot easier because then we know the things that we're not really good at. We're not going to get happiness in life by fixing all of our weaknesses. <laughs> we're going to be successful and happy in life by developing our strengths and then partnering with people who have other strengths that we don't. And that's the piece that we want to help kids discover, um, uncover, discover their strengths so that we're not just trying to fix problems. And unfortunately, in our school systems and in society, we're always looking to fix problems instead of building on the foundations of strengths. And so that's a piece that we hope we can leave you with. Um, and you maybe you'll get curious enough too to learn a little bit more about strengths. Um, Kathy and I do work, we do workshops and we do teach courses on using strengths in learning, losing strengths in our families. We'll be doing one again probably um, next month. And um, if you're curious and you wanna learn more with us, we do four week courses on that too. And you're welcome to, to join us for those. And if you'd like to, we can let you know when ours are gonna run. And also, you know, just there's a lot of resources. Um, Strength-based parenting is an excellent one. So you can certainly, um, that book, and it comes with a little code. Um, there's also other ones that you can use as well. But I can't see the chat box anymore, Kathy. So I'm not oh, sure. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Okay. And All Kathy right. put I'll the- I'll stop um, sharing. Thank you. Kathy put the, um, the link in. So if you fill that out, we'll be happy to send you the slides and our resource guide, because we pulled from a lot. With an hour, there wasn't time to really go into a lot of things. Originally, we thought this was gonna be an hour and a half, and we were gonna be able to do a little bit more, but with COVID, everything changed. So we're, we're all good with that. Uh, what's the so difference? So Alyssa, yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, go ahead, Monica. What's I was the just difference? read that one out loud. Yeah, what's, what's the difference in practice between rewards, consequences, and making things predictable? That's a really good question. Um, and I think the biggest thing when we're looking at is making things predictable is creating routines because when you're creating routines and it's predictable, then your brain doesn't have to keep making decisions all day long. One of the things that we're learning about in COVID and it's uh, 19 is that people get decision fatigue. So we're not really talking about when you do this, this will happen. We're talking more about how do you make things predictable enough that you can predict what's gonna happen. And one of the best ways that I know is uh, a game that I learned from Dr. Greenspan. He's a psychiatrist in, in Washington who's um, done a lot of work. And that's talking with kids ahead of time. How are you gonna feel? What's gonna to happen tomorrow? We call it the what about tomorrow? What's gonna to happen? How are you gonna feel when you do this? What do you think is gonna happen? So they can begin to look into the future and be predictable. Um, I think if we can keep our consequences down and not only use those when they're absolutely necessary, and then afterwards, you know, the, the goal of having a consequence is if, if it's going to happen to be able to do it in a kind way, not waiting until we are so stressed out and at the end of our rope, because then we're not regulated enough to actually, you know, allow that consequence to happen or 
you know, we've imposed what we call a limit. Um, we've, we've imposed a limit because we're the grown up here and we have to keep everybody safe. So when we're imposing a limit, we also need to make sure we're helping kids understand why we have this limit here. Because I think the why is the most important and we have to stay in connection. You know, as Kathy was saying, she had to calm down. And then once we're calm and we can then reconnect with kids. And, you know, Dr. Siegel has one, you know, connect before you redirect, right? We got to make sure that we're in connection and then and then we have to prepare because sometimes we're human and we're not always able to do this. So when we do flip our lid or we do have a response that's not predictable, um, you know, for our kids, then we have to go back and repair that also. Does that, did that help a little bit, Alyssa? I hope it did. Um, can I... Go ahead, Alyssa. Yeah, go ahead, Alyssa. Okay, um, so I work with... Um, uh, teens in care or youth in care and mm -hmm. so one of the things I struggle with especially with the CLSD kids or the like FASD kids or the cognitively impaired kids that they really need to know what to expect and you know like what kind of what you guys are talking about but when they come what ends up happening is in an effort for staff to do that they kind of lay out what the consequences are going to be as far as what boundaries and things like that and I'm not sure how to get away from here's what, what will happen if you do A, B, C, um, because like they need to know what might happen if they do something, but I'm not sure how to shift the focus to being, you know, more positive. You know, can I, can I answer that a little bit? Yeah, go ahead, Kathy, and I'll, I'll be okay. back after you. So I, I don't know if you're familiar, familiar with restorative um, conversations or restorative chats, but using questioning and starting with more like what happened, because as we very quickly went over uh, the iceberg, there's a lot happening below, and especially for kids who are coming into care out of very chaotic uh, systems, you know, it's not saying that you have permission to go beyond these boundaries, but a lot of, you know, they can't regulate. They haven't learned these skills. They don't know how to do that. And so, you know, helping them to regulate and then also go, well, what happened there? You know, what was going on? And ultimately we want kids, people to learn how can you repair your relationship? Because this is all about relationships and how, how you're going to relate to one another and how can you come in? And that's a whole nother thing, restorative conversations, but you know, how can you come in and help them to, to restore and repair harm? You know, once they've gotten to the point where they can, can be calm, but it takes a lot to learn those skills. And as adults, we have to know them for ourselves first. Yeah. And I was just going to add, yeah. I was going to add on to that. I used to, one of my first yeah. jobs out of college was at a um, residential treatment center. And we worked with kids. And obviously, if they're in a residential treatment center, something's gone way sideways in their lives, right? And I think even back then, we kind of knew that if you don't explain to kids why you have these, why we have these boundaries, why we have these limits, then it looks very arbitrary. And some of these limits may be triggering them. Um, I wish then I, I knew then what I now know, because I think some of our limits have to be, we have to watch out for each other, right? It's like wearing the masks right now. The mask isn't to protect me, it's to protect you. So we have to have these limits so that everybody is safe. And my job here is to keep everybody safe. And that's the message that the kids need to hear, right? That we have these boundaries, we have these limits so that everybody is safe. So if something's not working for you, we need to talk about it, right? So that's the conversation. And that has, that has to come from inside you. I mean, the kid has to say that, you know, you're here, you're looking out for me. It's not just about the rules. And I'm looking out for him. And they watch how you treat the worst kid, how you treat the worst kid's behavior. 
it tells them how safe they are, right? So I have to keep you safe. I have to keep myself safe. I have to keep everybody here safe. And that conversation I learned from somebody who worked on the floor, you know? I was an educational therapist. And it wasn't until we began having that. And that's Dr. Porges. Safety is treatment and treatment is safety. These kids don't feel safe in their own skin. Because, and for good reasons, right? Or maybe not good reasons. You know, we have some kids that have faulty neuroception. A lot of kids on the spectrum, their sensory systems. And again, in an hour, we couldn't talk about all these things. But, but the big thing is safety. We've got to create safety for kids. And we know that you really can't do learning unless kids feel safe. You know, that learning goes in one ear and out the other. <laughs> you know, the rules, they can't, why can't they remember the rules? Because they're not, they're not able to yet. So we thank you. We want to honor your time. We know we have to get out of here, but feel free if you'd like to have a conversation with Kathy or I, we could do another pop-up and talk about, you know, specific situations. Um, we're happy to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with folks. Again, you know, we're paying forward things that other people helped us learn. You know, we have our degrees, but we have a lot of, you know, it's more life experience, right? And um, our conversations with you are our way of paying it forward because so many people had these conversations with us or neither of us would be here or my hair would be all gray, you know, or I would not be doing very well. <laughs> Well, and with uh, and we have four children, um, all adopted from foster care, and so yeah, as I said to uh, Monica too, as we're putting this together, I got a lot of lived experiences. But yeah. I see that somebody, uh, Kathy, said, you know, when are we doing part two? So I encourage everybody to sign up on that Google <laughs> form. Yes, because uh, you know we do have a course. We've uh, done it once, and we kind of tailor it to the people who are in that uh, who we're working with. And uh, so, yeah, please sign up and we will let you know. Yeah, we just did it with um, there it is child care providers um, of essential workers. And I think it was really helpful for them to understand what was going on. And uh, we learned a lot too. We learn a lot every time we teach a strengths course or we work with a kid. You know, every kid, every person helps us learn too. So we're all learners on this journey. So thanks so much for coming. And I know we're supposed to get out of here because there's yeah, some- Yeah, we got to get out of here. They're going to kick so, us out. So yeah, I'm going to see- All right, it was great seeing time. everyone. Thanks everybody. Yeah. And feel free to reach out to us. We'd love to hear more. Bye. Comments. Bye. You want to save the chat, Kathy? Because I think you can- Oh, leave. yes, I will. Here, I'll Thank be you. the last one to leave here. That was beautiful. And I thanks get everybody. So. Thanks, that was really, really beautiful. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Because that yeah, is thank you. That is our job. And thank you for being teachers because that's very important to me as a mother of three. You know, two finished university and one going into senior year. Yeah. So there's so many learning moments and you know, the game the gaming for sure. Thank you. God for the gaming. And I was always questionable about screen use, the, the, the socializing, the, you know, whatever, whatever else technical, but the socializing, that's the most important as a parent, as a mother, that the Huge. kids are connecting. Thank God. Yeah. However yeah. it is, even if it's at 11 o'clock at night, I don't care. Yeah, it, right. their mental health is, is right right now during this pandemic, I think we have to keep in mind that people, they can learn things at any time in their lives, right? But if they're not, they're not feeling safe and secure in their own skin, it's just not going to work. So we better end this because I know Peter's going to be on our case about it. Okay, pardon. So, okay. I will save we'll the see chat and we will see you folks. Bye. Bye, Stephanie. We'll see you soon.